Good morning, and it's good to be with you this morning. Um, my name is Angela Walker, as you can see from the screen up there, but I just wanted to give a little bit more personal information about myself. Um, I'm not only an admissions counselor, but I'm also a sister. I'm also a friend, um, and I'm also a follower of Jesus. And I'm here to you uh, today to be with you just to give a word of encouragement, a word of hope, and a word of belief um, that the Lord is with us. And so um, I just want to share this prayer with you that I heard this weekend before we, we begin. Um, just a word from a woman named Jill Briscoe who has come and spoken to us here in chapel before. But she had this prayer of giving thanks to just the words that God has given her. So if you would pray with me. Give my words wings, Lord. May they alight gently on the branches of men's minds bending them to the winds of your will. May they fly high enough to touch the lofty, low enough to breathe the breath of sweet encouragement upon the downcast soul. Give my words wings, Lord. May they fly swift and far, winning the race with the words of the, widely wise, of the wordly wise to the hearts of men. Give my words wings, Lord. See them now nesting, down at thy feet, silenced into ecstasy, home at last. Amen. So I just want to read the scripture to you again. And if you would bear with me, I would love for you to close your eyes. Because sometimes we get wrapped up in reading through our Bibles. And sometimes we just need to have a bit of an imagination to quiet our minds and quiet our souls. So I'm going to read the scripture over to you again. And I just want, to want you to imagine yourself um, either Mary. Magdalene, whether it be Simon Peter or the other disciple, and just imagine what it would have been like to be at the tomb. Early on the first day of the week, still it, was, it was still dark. Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked at the strips of linen laying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He said, he saw and believed. I still do not understand the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look, at the, look into the tomb. She saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one on the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have, they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried on Aramaic. Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. As I prayed about our time together this morning, I asked God, how do you want to use me? He answered, with your story. I, of course, dismissed his response and went about my business. 
But this idea of sharing my story continued to come up. And I was confused because what does my story have to do with the empty tomb and the resurrection of Jesus? It turns out that my story, my journey, has everything to do with the empty tomb and the resurrection. As I thought about this and prayed about what parts of my story to share, it was, the, it was clear that the Lord was calling me to share honestly about my struggle with hope. For many years, I have kept hope at a distance because all that I experienced with hope was disappointment and unmet expectations. I would hope that a situation would turn out well, which actually means that I wanted the situation turned out how I wanted it to. And when it didn't, I would experience despair. And that despair and sadness would just be stuffed down. It was very infrequently that I would talk about my heartache, feeling overlooked, missed opportunities, or the grief from loss in my life. It was easy just to hide my pain and hide my tears and just keep, th keep moving along in life. I could only do that for so long before all the emotions that I had stuffed down inside, specifically unshed tears, came and found a way out. Those tears started coming about two months ago. The naming of pain and hurt started to happen, and I began to experience an unbelievable amount of healing and freedom. In a conversation with a friend the other day, she reminded me that the truth will set you free, free to love and free to be loved. And she was right. And I say this to you this morning because this is the backdrop of the empty tomb, the resurrection of Jesus. For me, this is, account reminds me that I don't need to live a hopeless life. I need to live a life hope-filled. It reminds me that Jesus, our teacher, our healer and savior, knows each one of us by name. He does not leave us or forsake us. And he wants us to live resurrected lives. As I read the account of the empty tomb, I was struck by the different responses of Simon Peter and the other disciples and Mary Magdalene. In the beginning of the chapter, when she first arrives to the tomb, Mary becomes a woman of action. She runs to go find Simon Peter and the other disciples and tell them what, he saw, what she saw. She wants them to find out what happened to the body of Jesus, for them to do something about it and to find her friend. She hopes they have a plan. Simon and the other disciple, who Jesus loved, come running towards the tomb to see for themselves. At first, they stand outside the tomb, and then they go inside and see the linen and the cloth that Jesus had been wrapped in. It's almost as if they just survey the situation just to make sure that Mary was right in what she saw. And sure enough, there was no body in the tomb. But Simon Peter and the other disciple did not do anything about it. Verse 10 says, the disciples went back to where they were staying. And as I read that verse, I was amazed at how the two disciples were able to just go back to what they were doing, unfazed by the missing body. But I think that is John's intention. The Simon and Peter and the other disciple are just minor characters in this account. In some ways, it allows us to, make, to pay more attention to Jesus' appearance to Mary. In verse 11, we see Mary weeping and crying at the tomb. I imagine this was not the nice, pretty cry that we see in the movies, but the real ugly cry, the snotty cry where our eyelids get red and puffy, the cry that is from deep down in your soul. Mary is in mourning, the loss of her friend and teacher, someone who is very close to her, who really saw her. The pain of her loss is very deep and very real. And I know there are people in this room who have experienced this type of pain and grief, where tears are their closest friends, and you can understand intimately what Mary was feeling. As we move along in the scripture, we now have Mary by herself, alone at the tomb, with her tears and grief and possibly some confusion. Maybe she was wondering and hoping that Simon Peter and other disciples will return with some good news about Jesus' body. Maybe she's thinking that if I wait long enough, someone will be able to tell her what happened. And as we read this account, we know what occurs is beyond what she could imagine. When Mary peeks her head into the tomb, she sees two angels. Mary does not seem at all surprised to see the angels at the tomb because she willingly answers their question. Women, why are, women, why are you crying? She is so concerned with finding Jesus that she will take all that she can get. She doesn't even stop to find out who these people are and ask why they're standing in the empty tomb. She's so overcome by love for her Lord that this detail does not matter. She's focused on 
being hopeful in finding Jesus and getting the help she needs to make this happen. So it's not enough that Mary encounters these random strangers in the tomb. She also meets a man who thinks she, he is the gardener. The gardener will also ask her very important questions. Why are you crying? And who are you looking for? Mary does not answer the questions. Instead, she pleads with the gardener to tell her where the body is. She says, sir, if you have him, he carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Mary is so persistent and so hopeful. Her belief in finding the body of Jesus is admirable. And this account gives me pause to stop and reflect on my own relationship with God. Am I as persistent to find God as I could be? How can I be more, more like Mary in my relationship with Jesus? And it's in this moment that Jesus reveals himself to Mary, saying her name. I imagine that the way he says her name was firm, yet tender and loving, affirming her hope and belief that she would find him. It is through her tears and grief that Mary believed that the man standing before her was the risen Christ. She had a hope that led her to turn around to see her teacher, her friend, and her savior. My brothers and sisters, my prayer for you today is that you would continue to believe and hope in the risen Christ. Even when he feels distant, when you can't seem to find him, Continue to believe. Continue to seek. Continue to hope. My prayer for you is to live a resurrection life. Live an empty tomb life. To live a life of freedom. To seek after Christ, even in your tears, even in your grief. To turn around and hear Christ say your name and find hope and comfort in him. Would you pray with me?